Bodhi Moran is our featured speaker today. Uh, Bodhi uh, is the site administrator of the Anthracite Heritage Museum, as well as Eckley Miners Village, both part of PHMC's operations in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Bodhi has advanced degrees in industrial archeology span and heritage, and has published on regional and international heritage issues. He is chairing the Society for Industrial Archaeology's conference, which is now rescheduled for the third time for August in Bethlehem. And he is helping coordinate the Anthracite Heritage Museum's special Indu industrial heritage tour to the UK this summer, as I've, as I've mentioned in June and July this summer. So without further ado, I want to introduce Bodhi Moran, who will speak to us about after Knox, remediation, heritage, and regeneration values on the anthracite landscape. We've been talking about Knox a whole lot. We're so glad that Bodhi is going to talk today about after Knox. So welcome, Bodhi. Thanks, Bob. Uh, and I've got one more uh, housekeeping issue. Um, we are recording this uh, program, and PCN is also recording it as well. So if there are anybody that, anyone that's on the program or does speak later, if you do not wish to be uh, recorded, um, you'd have to probably tune out and then look for this program at uh, either PCN or our website uh, uh, later on. So thanks again, Bob. Um, I'm happy to, to talk again about, uh, about what I find interesting and important about our region. Um, you know, we, we've talked about the Knox a lot. We've got exhibits about the Knox. Um, and as we all know, it's the symbolic end of, of, of coal mining. I mean, it's not the final end because we're still mining anthracite coal in the region, but it was that symbolic end, uh, end to mining. Um, but from our perspective, I think it was also the beginning of the heritage, the history and heritage period. The time when we will look back and we reflect on meaning and look for meaning in uh, in mining and uh, and the regional landscape. Um, so starting last year, we started to expand some of our Knox programming to really look at at the at what Knox meant to how we view and interact uh, with our region. Um, so my paper isn't going to deal much with the Knox specifically, but it's going to touch on some of those issues that I'm interested in um, interested in understanding. Uh, namely, how our history is um, how our history is impacted and impacts national history, um, and how our heritage is sort of compared or how it works on a national level. Um, at the current lecture, I think Bob and a few other people have made some comments about the fact that um, you know a lot of our history isn't really known well, you know, locally, and certainly it's not well known outside of our area. You know, I think back on who the, you know, who our new audience members are that come to the Anthracite Heritage Museum. I mean, you know, younger people that are just discovering um, the museum in our area. And sadly, it's because, you know, there were two, two mentions of the museum on the show, The Office. So we get a handful of people every year that want to know, is this the museum that was featured in The Office? Now, I'm not going to knock any reason for people to come to the museum, um, but I think that we really... I don't know. I, I'm interested in how we how we present our heritage and how we can incorporate things more on a national on a national basis. So the, the paper today that I'm going to give, I'm going to look at comparisons of how we will create, how we can think about our landscapes and think about managing our landscapes in a sustainable way, um, so that uh, so that we can kind of be thinking about broader broader purposes. Um, in the region. So let me go ahead and get that started. Okay, can everybody see the uh, the screen? Yes. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So like I say, this um, this paper is going to look at directions for future development in the region, um, so we can maybe better maximize our heritage decisions while balancing the needs for other types of landscape management um, and with a key on sustainability. You know, I believe we need to start thinking holistically about landscape and heritage management to maximize our resources and potential while working to overcome some of the, uh, some of the challenges to our mining legacy. Whoops. Huh. 
this thing a slide. Sorry about that. <laughs> so I think that um, probably the worst current example of ma landscape management from this holistic perspective um, is the Huber Breaker site. You know, for starters, you know, despite a well-organized community-led effort that lasted 30 years, you know, we didn't save the last and one of the most significant breakers and landscape features of our region. And we're still left with a toxic mess on that, on that site. Now that may change, of course, if it, uh, you know, if the courts have their way and we all have our way and get a better site. But really few of if any of the goals set out in the sale and demolition of the site have been met. You know, the challenge for industrial heritage, um, especially of large complex industries, is to balance the need to remediate, clean and renew a landscape's potential uh, while ensuring that enough key historic features remain to ensure a stable regional identity and to draw new, uh, new outsiders. So from a sustainability standpoint, sustainability can take many directions in heritage, but in its basic form, uh, the key is to provide equal or greater value than costs to meet current needs and ensure the continued access and conservation of that heritage for future generations. A value can be defined in economic terms which is often the case, but could also include history, identity, memory, aesthetics, resource conservation, and access. And costs can be defined in economic, historical identity and memory terms, but also include health, environmental factors, and accessibility. Often the very highest forms of conservation are not suitable for a variety of reasons and compromises to reach sustainability are necessary. Um, industrial heritage significance is enhanced with longevity, with longevity. But often that longevity means that we also have major issues with landscape and waste. In the US, we have federal laws that both promote remediation of significant heritage um, and also clean up significant environmental damage. Um, and when both cleanup and preservation are necessary, um, you know, we, compromises have to be made to fulfill both mandates to give us a usable um, and functioning landscape. And these are compromised landscapes. You know, this paper will examine some copper mining sites in Montana um, and then look at a, a, a site much closer to home, uh, both that had very long periods of production um, and had some need for cleanup. Uh, let me see. <laughs> so sorry about the, sorry about the slide. So I'm going to read uh, some quotes from um, historians Peter Goyne and Elizabeth Raymond from a paper they published in 2001 about the region. All observers, um, all observers agreed that the meaning of this place, its reason for its significance lay in the coal that was extracted from its hillsides. This place was by nearly universal agreement all about anthracite. It is a condition that continues today, long after active mining has ceased. And yet amidst all the physical devastation of more than a century of mining, the regional landscape is inscribed with an alternative story. Not all observers decry the calm banks. Indeed, for, some, for the descendants of the miners who produced them, these derelict scenes constitute monuments of sort, monuments of a sort. Calm banks are, if nothing else, new testimony to the bone-breaking work of immigrant ancestors. They are now familiar contours that are part of the vernacular landscape. Here, the production of coal has the dignity of history and heritage, as well as the stigma of environmental degradation. Mining may have destroyed the earlier landscapes of pure mountain streams, but it also provided the means for generations of immigrants to support themselves and raise families. Calm banks may be weedy, dirty, and ugly, but they are also makeshift memorials to thousands of anonymous laborers. Anthracite is an integral part of the region's sense of place. Even 40 years after its cessation, which is now 60 years, mining is still the basis of regional pride. Aside from the Wyoming massacre, coal is the only reason uh, this region ever appeared on the historical stage. In this region, the degraded, the degraded environment is undergoing reclamation and remnants of, the mi uh, remnants of mining are slowly being removed. Yet as geographer Richard Francavilla points out, drastic landscape alteration is the very essence of mining. Thus the same processes that redeem the despoiled landscape simultaneously destroy it. For public historians, the region provides an example of the paradoxes inherent in the preservation and interpretation of mining landscapes. So environmental issues um, are largely a matter of science and politics, um, but heritage is much more subjective. So how do we define what, the, what ideal heritage is? You know, what should our ultimate goals be? Is it a completely preserved structure in its original setting? Does it include people? What about value, identity, and memories? 
then can tangible heritage truly exist without intangible heritage? Of course, the success of heritage hinges on many things. And our ideal heritage must meet community values with meaningful conservation, management, and access. An important feature of ideal heritage is, of course, sustainability. Uh, sustainable heritage must manage current needs to ensure long-term accessibility and conservation to guarantee that future generations can apply their values and enjoy these places. It must overcome contemporary site problems that may impact future use and conservation. Industrial heritage, unlike say house museums or military installations can encompass huge landscapes. Sometimes significant industrial heritage owes parts of its significance to longevity. Longevity and scale enhance significance, but also pose potential problems for long-term sustainability. Some of those long-term sites, especially starting in the 19th and 20th centuries, had such a scale of operations that they generated considerable industrial waste and landscape change. And in certain instances, those may corrupt sustainability. While not all significant industrial sites were generally bad polluters, such as the Paquette plant in Detroit where Henry Ford invented the Model T, or Slater Mill in Rhode Island, one of the first integrated mills in the United States. Further, some sites associated with worker housing like Eckley or existed on a small scale did not generate the levels of environmental waste that required significant intervention. Oh, there's the, uh, there's the, the Huber slide I was looking for. <laughs> um, much of the significance, um, I'm sorry, but many of these sites, including some of the largest manufacturing and longest run uh, mining operations, um, you know, did require significant intervention. Um, and even small scale waste can be magnified over a century. Much of the significance of these places is tied up in their longevity and scale. Taking into account that copper mines can effectively process ores down to 0.5% rich means that 99.5% of the ore is waste and that on multiple occasions, smelter smoke legal disputes were settled at some of the highest courts in the land. In fact, metal pollution, uh, metalworks pollution has been documented as far back as the Roman era, and smelter smoke lawsuits have been argued for centuries. You know, further exacerbating the situation is that there have been few laws or rules for the disposition of waste beyond nuisance laws. The early 20th century notion of conservation and mining was tied solely to managing the resources and having nothing to do with long-term waste disposal in the environment. But let me also echo Franco Vidalia, Goyne, and Raymond and say that not all waste should or needs to be re remediated. In fact, unless there is an impending harm to human health or the environment, um, it is in the best interest of heritage uh, to preserve those waste streams as significant contributors to the heritage landscape. Um, and we do, we certainly still have a, a lot of these uh, remnants around our areas. Um, but a lot of them are disappearing for, um, a lot of the comb banks are disappearing for, uh, for cogen plant use. But we do have instances where severe landscape does require significant uh, intervention. Um, through the mid, through the 19th and 20th centuries, the United States had years of expanding industrial production. American output affected the outcome of two world wars, changed the structure of global wealth, firmly established a middle class and by and large created the consumer economy. Much of this was done over a period with little regard for the non-commercial byproducts of production. Factories dumped wastewater into rivers and oceans, vented acidic gases into the atmosphere, and allowed chemical waste to seep into soils and groundwater. Mines and smelter sites, often in sparsely populated areas, simply left their waste tailings, calm and slag wherever they could and usually only considered them again if they interfered with production. It wasn't until the 20th century that people in the United States began to question the lasting effects of industrial activity on the landscape, especially as environmental disasters seemed preventable and studies demonstrating the long-term effects of exposure to more, to more invisible toxins became more alarming. Beginning in the 1940s, Congress passed laws regulating the output and transportation of hazardous substances. And in 1970, the EPA was created whose mission was simply to protect human health and the environment. The Clean Air Act of 1970 substantially expanded the Air Pollution Control Act of 1955, and the Clean Water Act of 1972 substantially expanded the 1942 Federal Water Pollution Control Act. Both went a long way to curb current and future pollution by setting limits to discharges and establishing penalties. The Resource Recovery, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act of 1976 established rules for the transportation and disposal of hazardous waste 
While all three of these acts had implications for future, for current and future pollution, they did little to remediate the persistent effects of past pollution and existing hazardous waste deposits. Now that all changed in 1980. In the 1970s, members of the housing development in New York discovered a significant deposit of industrial waste buried below a residential district. For decades, that community had been experiencing much higher incidence of nervous system disorders, birth and early childhood complications and blood diseases stemming from groundwater impacted by concentrated industrial deposits. In 1980, Congress passed the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, uh, more, more commonly referred to as Superfund, to identify significant sites of past pollution, categorize them on a national priorities list based on potential threats to human health, and plan for and execute the remediation of those sites. In those instances where a responsible party could not be identified, a CERCLA provided public money, the Superfund, raised from chemical and petroleum taxes to pay for the remediation of significant polluted, significantly polluted sites. Uh, similar to uh, Pennsylvania's leadership role in, in the development of mining laws, Pennsylvania also had a hand in creating several key early environmental laws. In 1905, the, Purities, the Purity of Waters Act was established to preserve the waters of the state for protection of public health. In 1937, the Clean, Water, Clean Streams Law was passed expanding protection for Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania waterways against sewage and industrial discharges and regulated the impact of mining operations on waterways. In 1945, the Surface Mining Conservation and Reclamation Act was passed and is considered to be the first comprehensive attempt to prevent pollution from surface mining, from surface coal mining. It provided for the conservation and improvement of land affected in connection with surface mining and provided for the establishment of an emergency bond fund for anthracite deep mine operators. Then in 1947, um, the state passed the Anthracite Strip Mining and Conservation Act. Uh, it provided for the regulation of mining of anthracite coal by the open, open pit or strip method um, and for the conservation improvement of the lands directly affected or directly impacted by mining. It required laborers to be licensed to pay fees and secure permits. Um, and it also required backfilling of stripping pits and the leveling and planting of affected lands to prevent erosion and pollution of waters and to protect public health, safety, and welfare. In 1970, the Department of Environmental Resources was formed, combining the Department of Forests and Waters and other environmental conservation and public health programs into a single department. In 1995, that, uh, that department was then split into two, two new groups, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, DCNR, and the Department of Environmental Protection, DEP. And key for us is that since 1982, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection has administered the Abandoned Mine and Reclamation Program in Pennsylvania under Title IV of the Service Mining Control and Reclamation Act of 1977. So while some of the 1,300 sites listed on the national priorities list are military bases, warehouses, and transportation sites, the, more, the majority of them were listed because of long-term industrial activity. Because of this longevity, many of these places also hold historic significance to American economic, social, and industrial history. And arguably much of America's importance on the world stage can be attributed to its rapid growth and industrial output between 1850 and 1950. You know, while environmental laws have been a relatively recent phenomenon, you know, formal heritage laws in the United States date back to the early 20th century. Over the last hundred years, the United States has developed a system to identify and document structures and landscapes of regional and national significance, and to preserve and interpret significant structures and landscapes held privately, regionally, and by governments. The U.S. Antiquities Act of 1906 first permitted the official designation of historic landmarks and created penalties for harm caused effectively on cultural resources. Sixty years later, the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 expanded the National Register of Historic Places, created and assigned duties to the State Historic Preservation Offices, and established rules for managing historic resources on federal property. And in Pennsylvania, of course, since 1947, we have the State History Code, which defines how the state will manage, interpret, and preserve um, historic resources that are, are key to the, uh, to the state's history. And it also set up the PHMC, uh, which, uh, which runs uh, the uh, Eckley and Anthracite Heritage Museum. 
So the issues that we have that we're facing are that many of these longstanding sites have these dichotomous legacies. You know, on the one hand, they hold significance to American history and mark important economic, social, and technological development. And as such, they're important heritage sites. On the other hand, they are responsible for many of the most egregious pollution releases, requiring extensive cleanups and conferring considerable cost. Federal laws articulated by the National Historic Preservation Act and Superfund exist to protect and correct folk legacies for the betterment of the public. So to meet this first level of sustainability, um, we need to manage the approach to cleanup to ensure that significant heritage sites meet basic standards for public safety and stabilization, um, and therefore ensure future accessibility. We need to find those compromises between environment and heritage to reach sustainability. So looking at a couple of examples now, um, one of the largest industrial landscapes in the country, uh, especially mining landscapes of a certain age, often encompass both high degrees of significant heritage and considerable levels of pollution. The Butte Anaconda Montana Copper District encompass both the largest productive copper district in the world for a period of time, one of the longest lived copper mines, and became the largest Superfund project at the time. The Butte, uh, Butte Anaconda is a key industrial heritage landscape in this country, and also one of the most polluted. One of its, its key, some of its key heritage, or like I said, it's one of the longest run copper mine and smelter complexes in the US, it was the largest copper mine or copper smelter um, in the world for a time. It was the largest copper company in the world for a time. And it created a political system to control state government and media. But this heritage and this longevity coupled with significant deposits of sulfide ores led to a critical pollution problem. In fact, the company that began in the 1880s was only starting to slow down about the time the U.S. was considering the impacts of waste disposal on the landscape. The timing of both the shutdown of mining operations and smelter operations was curiously close to the implementation of new stricter laws. So some of the, uh, some of the key problems um, in this area have to do with heavy metals, uh, phosphates, contaminated drinking water, um, uh, heavy, uh, then, then in Anaconda, heavy metals, um, smelter smoke, uh, lots of waste and groundwater. And one thing I didn't list on here was that uh, 125 miles of Clark Fork were, uh, were strewn with tailings from this operation from the century of operations as well. Oops. So the challenge for heritage pro proponents in this region uh, were to negotiate for the conservation of significant, uh, significant structures amid a heavily funded cleanup, uh, with cleanup professionals not necessarily sharing the same values and not fully appreciating the nuances of preservation law. This conflict ultimately led to a compromised landscape that, um, while it's ostensibly remediated, um, it did leave uh, some, and it did leave some heritage on the landscape. Um, you know, the cleanup here began in the 1980s and eventually included cultural resources surveys and assessments as required under federal law. Ultimately, the values for significant heritage are very considerably. And even though this, um, this $1 billion cleanup spent some money on, uh, on heritage, um, it, you know, it, it didn't really do enough to save uh, such a, a substantial portion of it. Um, and I think that's some of the issues that we're facing here today, although we don't have the, I don't want to say the benefit of significant federal funds to, uh, to do broader, to broader, uh, broader studies um, and surveys of the region. So looking a little closer to home, uh, much closer to home, um, the Anthracite Heritage Museum and Lackawanna Mine Tour uh, were developed on a state and county level at a former mining location undergoing remediation. Um, the anthracite coal industry provided the first significant change to energy production for the young U.S. starting in the 18th century and peaked in 1917. Um, and while giving way to other to alternate fossil fuels, including bituminous coal, oil, and natural gas, anthracite is, of course, still mined, uh, mined today. Uh, Pennsylvania anthracite deposits cover 484 square miles in 11 counties. Over its history, it operated thousands of locations and employed millions of workers. Much of the early mining was done underground and much of the later mining was done on the surface. But with such a long history, the industry left a heavily altered landscape. Efforts have been made to preserve some key features of the landscape like Eckley and the Doran Span and, and a number of other locations. Um, while other sites and other, other uh, 
mining landscapes have been uh, have been remediated and turned to some some sort of uh, safe or productive land use. Um, but we've never really approached approached our landscape in a holistic manner. So getting back to McDade Park, um, you know, the mining site had two key eras. One was in the 1850s um, and the other in the 1950s and 1960s. It was not a significant producer, but as you can see, it was very close to population centers um, and other components of this uh, mining, this, this sort of mining region's uh, reuse, such as the landfill, um, are not really compatible for, uh, for, a, lot of, um, for a lot of reuse. Or, or a lot of public reuse. Um, part of the impetus for this project uh, was in reaction to the energy crisis of the 1970s and the expectation that U.S. coal reserves would be tapped um, at a much higher level than they had been in the 1960s and 50s to offset the loss of access to global oil supplies. Um, this project presumed that there would be an increase in the number of surface mines, which would later require some sort of remediation. So this project in Scranton took, uh, took an abandoned mining landscape and created a public space out of it. While the majority of the park uh, appears to deny the, the site's early history, the project did preserve the underground mine um, and convert it into a, a tourist mine and created the Anthracite Heritage Museum. And if you poke around in the woods, which I'm not sure that I can suggest that you do, you find there are still a lot of other remnants from those early mining landscapes that still exist. So unlike the Butte Anaconda District, this project began with a heritage component included from the start. Uh, fortunately, some of the waste tips, like I said, are still in the landscape, but they are largely hidden and off limits to the public. Um, and outside of the mine tour, um, you know, the park is a relatively pleasant and easy, easy landscape to enjoy. Um, so overall, I'd like to say that not, you know, not all decisions um, regarding heritage and environment are easy. Um, and some become more difficult, uh, and, and we do have to search for these compromises. Um, but like I said, I, I, there we really haven't had a comprehensive environmental, or I'm sorry, a comprehensive heritage plan for our region. Um, I gave a paper at the, for Mind and History Month last year, and I showed a slide where I had counted over 100 heritage organizations in our region. But we don't really, we, don't, we, we all know what's going on with everybody, but we don't really coordinate uh, very well. Um, it seems like we have decent coordination on the environmental side, DEP, FCAMR, um, the Nature Conservancy. So there's a lot of groups that are working on landscape remediation and uh, productivity issues. Um, but I think that we need to be a little bit better focused as heritage proponents to, um, to better understand our landscape and hopefully not lose, uh, well, first identify what's left that's not protected as far as heritage resources. And then, um, and then work work to uh, to come up with a comprehensive plan to to encourage preservation. Just a quick note: I did a, did some very unscientific calculations, and I looked at um, the number of national register listed properties in the anthracite region, and I came up with 207. Um, now, of course, there are lots of caveats. Pennsylvania is a very old and historic place in our country. But the total number of National Register properties in the state are 300 or 3,441. So the percentage in NEPA is just 6% of that total. Um, you know, the, uh, the program on Wednesday or, or on Thursday, I mentioned several people sort of lamented that we're not, um, that our story isn't, isn't well known enough outside the region. And I think this kind of reflects the fact that we're, that we're, we're, not behind, but I think there needs to be a, an effort that we, we spearhead to, um, to identify more of the resources and do a better job of getting them listed on the National Register. Um, so anyway, I guess that's about all I have to say uh, today. I will thank you for, um, thank you for listening. Um, so I will turn it back over to Bob and then see if we've got anything in the chat that anybody wants to, um, to bring up or the Q and A, let me see. Bodhi, do you wanna do uh, a Q and A now or do you wanna Wait. Well, I don't, we could do a QA and a at any time. We don't have any questions in the Q&A. So if, if, you, if people do have questions, you could click on the Q&A and type in your question. Um, in chat. Or in the chat. I don't see, let me see. I see some comments in the chat, but I don't see any questions. 
So why don't we, we can just move on and then okay. as questions or comments come up, we can, um, oh, I'm sorry, there is a hand raised. Let me see. Oops. All right, so this is new, answering a hand raised. Oh, Elaine. All right, so uh, uh, Elaine, I will, let me see. If you have a question. Uh, my question or actually comment is that uh, what was taking place at the time the, um, uh, the mine tour in the park uh, were, were being developed was that the entire West Mountain was suffering from mine caving mm -hmm. uh, for houses that were, uh, the houses that were there uh, happened to be that one of the houses was where I was living as a kid and um, I was kind of broken half because the uh, part of the land caved in. Um, and um, that, that was kind of one of the issues of, of uh, why the, the land had to be uh, like really remediated uh, rather than like saved in its industrial state. Uh, so, um, you know, I don't know if you encountered that in your research, but that was a big issue in the 1960s. Uh, Dan Flood was, was involved in developing the, the project uh, um, as, as uh, I forget exactly what it was called, but it was, um, it was uh, probably like what was the beginning of, of many other projects in, in uh, restoring land that had been um, damaged in, due to mine caving in this area. And um, I hope you were able to hear me. Oh yeah, no, we, yeah, we okay, hear you. I wasn't sure how that was working. Um, well, it's, it's new to us too. Okay. Well, it's, it's, thank you. And it's interesting. I, I got a call um, just last year from somebody that lived in that same neighborhood that was having some mine, some stidence issues with their house. And yeah, they, I'm surprised, you know, that they, they built all these new properties there um, like 10, 20 years ago. And um, I doubt that they've really done much remediation. Um, I heard, you know, like they're, they're uh, on, on Oak Street, this is farther south in Taylor. Uh, they built this whole new senior uh, apartment complex. And um, that, that was also like coal land. It was coal dumps there at the time. And um, there's somebody who lived near there as it was being built. And one of their um, back load, uh, front loader machines actually fell into the mines <laughs> when they were building it. So obviously it was an issue that is probably not well addressed even now that they're, they're uh, building uh, you know, properties on, on undermined land without really uh, developing a uh, remediation for it. And it, you know, people are, are no doubt suffering the consequences. I've heard, you know, like all these uh, people who live in these um, uh, houses that are, are off of uh, Kaiser Avenue uh, between Luzerne Street and, and uh, the road, uh, I forget what we call it, Snake Road. I forget exactly what the official name of it is, it, um, that goes up to the museum, uh, goes up to McGate Park. Um, all those new houses, some of them are having caving issues because mm -hmm. the people, you know, just, you know, 30, 40 years goes by and people just forget about it and they don't, you know, deal with the issues that are still remaining, that the land is um, undermined, that the pillars are robbed, um, that the, the land can still, you know, cave and, and um, you know, they haven't taken issues to fill it in or anything like that. I mean, they just fill it, fill it Elaine, in. Elaine, Elaine, can I just interrupt you there and, and ask if uh, we want to move on? But uh -huh. Bodhi, Bodhi, apropos to that, is there another region in the country or Pennsylvania that is as urbanized as the Wilkes-Barre Scranton, especially in Northern Field, but also Hazleton and other areas? and has an extractive industry in and around it. Because I, 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 we, are, we are a massive urbanized area mm -hmm. with mining going on under our feet. We were, 
Yeah, yeah I, there's certainly nothing to the scale that that this mining district has. Um, and I think that's some of the some of the topics that I'm interested in when we get to the point where we can redevelop some of our exhibits at the museum. You know, this I think this is a unique area. You know, we, we've had millions and millions of miners that have worked here. We've had thousands of companies. Um, and it's, you know, 250 some years of anthracite mining, so close to large urban populations. It's it's a very unique, it's a very unique place. Um, but but I but most mining seems to be done in rural areas. So, you know, it's you know, you go where the minerals are, but this one happens to be, you know, we happen to be in a pretty densely populated area because of our longevity and because of the, the amount of coal that was here. I recall Richard Healy, who is tuned in from England right now. I recall him once saying that the entire anthracite region should be put on the uh, national register, but uh, I've never seen an effort to lead uh -huh. that. Well, there are a handful of, of sites of, uh, on the national register and, and we are pretty well represented with state historical markers. Yeah. Um, the thing that I think that we really need, but is really not possible or practical is a national heritage area. You know, you look at, at, at the 50 or so national heritage areas in the country, and they start off with federal funding and they start off with broad surveys to identify historic sites. Um, and it comes with funding to sort of manage that. You know, there's one in Detroit, there's one in Dayton, there's one in West Virginia Coal. Um, the only reason I can't really support that is because we already have three national heritage areas in the coal region. And, um, you know, any, and each one of them is doing, dealing with some, some component of, of anthracite heritage. And, uh, you know, while I think we need something broad and inclusive for the anthracite region. Um, you know, if we go to the National Heritage Area table, we're taking, you know, resources away from some of these other organizations that are doing really great work for our region. Well, very good. I, I think we ought to move on yeah. and uh, introduce uh, Jay before moving on to the tribute. But I just wanted to answer a couple chat questions. Uh, PCN, and I again want to extend my thanks to PCN for broadcasting the Pesmania Cable ne uh, Network. They're recording and broadcasting the current lecture Thursday night. They've done that at King's College with Paul Shackle. They're doing it right now with this program, uh, with Bodie and the rest of us. They're going to do um, next Wednesday's program at Lackawanna Historical Society with Richard Healy. And they did last night the uh, program at Luzerne County Historical Society, Society organized by Mark Rossetti. PCN has recorded those. The local historical societies and institutions have also recorded them. PCM is going to broadcast them at some future date and rebroadcast them. So if you want to hear some of these, um, if you want to hear this one, you, 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 I gather, contact Bodhi. If you want to hear the one at King's, you contact Tom Mackerman. It's in our program. And the, and the entire schedule of events you can find at the Anthracite Heritage Foundation's website. OK? So we have recorded these for, for posterity and educational, future educational purposes. Well, we're so glad to have Jay Smarr here with us. Um, Jay Smarr has been here before to entertain us. We always like to have some music at this event. We've been doing it since, since 1999, the anth annual anthracite commemoration at the Heritage Museum in Scranton. Jay's done it a number of times. Last year, we had Don Chappelle do it. We've had a lot of different people, accordionists included. Mm -hmm. uh, let me introduce Jay. Um, yeah, over the last 10 years, Jay Smarr has toured Scotland twice, received recognition from the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, performed at the Philadelphia Folk Festival twice, recorded music for the Welsh BBC documentary, The Welsh in America, and has been selected as the Pennsylvania Performing Arts on tour to be their, uh, their professional, uh, to be on their professional touring roster. He has generously consented to entertain us today. So uh, Jay, please take it away and welcome back to the uh, Anthracite Museum. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bodhi, for allowing me to perform today. Uh, I do uh, a lot of coal mining music from my area. I live in the Southern Coal Field uh, near the, below Pottsville now, but I'm originally from Coaldale, a little coal mining town right on the very eastern edge of uh, Schuylkill County, where my grandfather was a coal miner there for uh, over 50 years. He was Slavic, his name was Krakowicz. 
So a lot of the songs that I write and uh, uh, are about uh, are indigenous to that particular region of the, the coal fields. Uh, but today, uh, and there was another gentleman named George Corson, who during the 1950s actually did recordings. He recorded coal miners in our region uh, singing uh, their songs. And I'm not sure how good you could see this book. Could you see that, Bob? Yes, we can see it, Bodie. Famous book. Minstrels of the Mind Patch. Uh, there's uh, all these tunes. Uh, it's a great book. And uh, like I said, I won't talk real uh, long about that. But uh, the song that I, I'm going to do, uh, I do also original coal mining songs of the region, like I said, due to my uh, grandfather's uh, work in the coal mines. And I'm going to do a song about Centralia. And those of you not familiar with that, it's a mine fire that is still uh, burning today. We we're talking about subsidences there uh, before a little while ago. And uh, there is this book. This is by David Decock. I'm not sure. Could you see that? Yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, David Decock uh, was a journalist uh, down the Harrisburg area. It's called Unseen Danger. And uh, the Centralia Mine Fire, uh, in a nutshell version of this, basically we're saying it once again about subsidences occurring in the coal fields. Uh, They're saying that this fire was burning underneath the town. It was not safe to live there. The government was not making the people, but suggesting them to, to move to a different area. And they actually, the government went as far as to build them another town to go to. Some people stayed there. Some people went to this new town. Uh, don't forget, you know, this was four uh, uh, levels of family uh, living there. So it, it's, uh, and it was their, their household, uh, their, their home heritage. Uh, so just put yourself in their boots and the government's telling you to leave because it's uh, not safe to be there and you're in your great grandparents' house. So it's a little tough for them to leave. But anyway, this song is about, uh, is what I, uh, the information I got from that book, Unseen Danger by David Decon. And also I was permitted to interview one of the mayors of uh, Centralia at the time, Lamar Mervine, uh, who back in the 90s was in his mid 80s. And uh, this is more a compilation of uh, the information from the book and also uh, Mr. Mervine. Um, the thing is there, as uh, Bodhi had said earlier about there's so much coal in our region still um, that a lot of the local folks in Centralia thought that uh, the reason why the government wanted them to leave is the rule was as long as there's one person left in town, they couldn't get to this coal that was under Centralia. So uh, a lot of the locals had mixed feelings about leaving. But anyway, this is called the Fires of Centralia. It's on uh, my album, uh, Folklore and Coal Mining Songs of Northeast Pennsylvania. <laughs> No one's sure just how it started or how the mine fire spread. The Commonwealth had issued warnings this fire could bring death. A town of miners and miners' families, once 2,000 strong. The same King Cove that gave it birth might kill it for too long. Some say the vein that big mine runs saw flames in 32. Never die, or catch your breath and spread its fiery flu. Others tell the tale the garbage tossed in stripping pits. Might have been the winkly fuel to keep the fire leaking. Demon burned on township sites, but the borough first turned to call. The three full days fell short with thousand Shire borough walls. For lack of funds, the state was called to ease financial loads. But a town so small was no concern till six months down the road. Oh, Centralia. Pennsylvania, 
Your dying future is in need. The state will claim to care about you, but is it really hidden greed? Until then, the tension grew, the secret engineers to evaluate, contemplate, and not come without fear. First stop was to excavate over 100 acres of coal, but what cost 80 million, and most of all, destroy 100 homes. Holes were bored in strip and walls packed with the flammables. Never were they reinforced, more air came through the holes. A tread surrounding the fire bug through the core of town. Might have been an answer prayer, but was taught to split the ground. Now one deployed at north, the miners patience turned to rage. His cover bear no food found there till he back in the mine shaft cage. Companies of coal donated funds to dig it out. But why the government stopped the Monday short lived town folk deep in down. Oh Centralia. Who could blame you to live and die on the land you love? Oh, Centralia, to stay or leave won't shame you if it comes to push or shove. The borough owns the mineral rights, gold barons own the land. Forty million worth of coal, though not touched by man. But as long as one centrillion stays and holds their ground, no government, no establishment can be mine in this town. Who must touch the year's pollution came and went. The AML gave the state some cash, but on account will not be spent. Federal fund proposal sought to relocate the town. 400 voted to stay right there. 600 turned them down. Homes were bound, used market price by government for sale. Some would move to Denmark Gardens, but others couldn't be swayed. In 92, the state declared eminent domain meant these great grandchildren on their own homes the rent they might now pay oh centralia they try to tame ya 40 years of the same old go oh centralia I know it pains ya, and I pray they see enough's enough. Remember, no one shows just how it starts, or how the mind fire spreads. But what's left of town's on little ground, but they'll stay there till their deaths. Lamar and Lana of Mervine blood, and a few left on the hill. Resist the state. Officials warning, yes, they always will. But to leave the land or take a stand on ground for families old, I'd need a blast for such attack. I'd be drunk down to my soul. And here's some time still a 99 stuck in some small town news. Mind us of the deep mind fire. How deep our family roots. Oh, Centralia. I get into, uh,
Thank you, Ms. Can I hear a little bit? Great one. Hey, Jay, um, your the volume, your volume got quiet about halfway through. Oh, it did. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Is it back up to volume now? Back up high now? Yeah. Well, we we can turn our volumes up at our end too. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I'm pretty uh, computer. Is that better? Mm -mm. We okay? Is that better? Oh, that's that's better now. Okay, great. Uh, this is a a picture inside. Could you see that picture? Okay. Yeah. That's taken inside the Tuckerton coal mine, which is outside of Tamaqua, Pennsylvania, in Schuylkill County. And this was taken uh, 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 in the mine where George Corson did a lot of his uh, recordings. Record well, not a lot, but he recorded some coal miners in there uh, singing uh, Avondale Mine Disaster, one song in his book, was actually recorded in there. A guy named John Quinn sang it. And you could see one gentleman here in the middle uh, doing some some fiddling and a, a, no, I'm sorry, the gentleman here on the left is doing some fiddling. This gentleman's doing some clog dancing here. And this is Mr. Corson here. So to end up with the program, I'm going to kind of combine them a little bit. And there was also a gentleman named Patrick Reynolds, who is a, a, an author from, has uh, Pennsylvania profiles down in Lancaster. And he also states that there were musicians in our region who would grab a piece of sheet metal from the local coal mine, throw it on the ground, and they would flat foot fiddle and sing for food or for clothing or for a night's lodging. And uh, this song is about my grandfather. As I mentioned, he was Czechoslovakian. His name was Krakowicz. And from what I was told, the most coal mine bosses were German and Welsh because they had some prior experience in proper coal mining. So um, about my, this is about my grandfather trying to raise his family on a coal miner's pay. And uh, I'll end up with a little bit of that. And thank you for inviting me to perform for you. Oh, I do have a website. It's jsmar.com, J-A-Y-S-M-A-R.com. It's called I Am an Old Coal Miner. You won't be able to see the clock and hopefully you could just hear it. Oh, well, that's not me, no chicken, but that's 
Very good, Jay. And Jay does have the website. Um, tell, what, tell us what it is again, Jay. It's jsmar.com, J-A-Y-S-M-A-R.com. And he has CDs mm -hmm. for sale. I never travel without a CD in my, in my easy reach of, uh, from Jay Smar because I love listening to his music. He's got, how many CDs do you have, Jay? Uh, about eight of them now. About eight of them now, yeah. Well, again, thanks, thanks so much for, for performing this afternoon. I'm now going to go ahead, Jay. I said my honor. Okay, yeah. I'm now going to turn it back to Bodhi uh, for the tribute uh, uh, portion. We're going to begin the tribute with a special short uh, film by Dave Brocka. You may know Dave Brocka as the as the um, filmographer behind the recent Knox Mine Disaster documentary, and Dave's been a regular attendee at these events in Scranton. Of course, he's in California right now, couldn't come in for this, but he did send the link and he's working this afternoon, so he couldn't even tune in via Zoom, but he did send the link to us uh, of this, uh, by the way, three-year-old, I think, maybe four-year-old documentary, which he did as a tribute to Bill. Um, and so Bodhi's going to run that, hopefully. Um, thanks, Bob. And, and just another, uh... No, it, it when, after the after the film, which is about ten minutes long, we'll do uh, personal tributes to Bill um, Bill Hasty. So why don't we try? If if anybody wants to speak, if you could raise your hand. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not exactly sure where the hand raise button is for at the bottom. It's sorry. at the bottom. It's at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so on the bottom of the screen, and then we will. I will select you as we go just down the list of people who have uh, raised their hands for that. If you don't see it, put your cursor down right next to leave on the right. It'll pop up. Raise hand. I'm Bill Hasty. Oh, just a sec. I'm Bill Hasty. At the Knox Coal Company, I was officially an outside laborer, but I spent more time inside than I did outside. And even on the outside, I worked in dangerous jobs that called for a higher rate of pay than, than I was getting. I rode rope on the main schoolie slope for about a year and a half. I got a flat rate of $2 an hour, seven hour shifts, $14 a day. I worked just nine years. It came to an abrupt ending, of course. <laughs> William A. Hasty Sr. was born in West Pittston, Pennsylvania on May 28, 1919, to a Welsh-American mother and a Scottish-American father, the second of six children. He graduated from West Pittston High School in 1936 and quickly enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1938. Bill would serve two tours of duty initially defending the outer perimeter of the Panama Canal in Puerto Rico, followed by the North African, Sicilian, and Italian campaigns, including the Battle of Anzio during World War II. This insignia here is 7th Army, and this is 5th Army, and this is the rare insignia. When we left North Africa for Sicily, we were I Armored Corps, and then at sea we became 7th Army. And General Patton later on made one of his bombastic speeches, and he said, Born at sea, baptized in blood, the horrified 7th Army. That's Purple Heart. George Patton, in my estimation, was a complete psychopath, and he was greatly overrated. After the war, Bill returned to his hometown of West Pittston, and on April 29, 1950, Bill got hitched to Betty Jane Groves. But these are all my in-laws. Well, this is my wife's grandparents here, and there are six sons, and this is Bob Groves. Bob Groves. Uh, 
Phil, the oldest son, was about to leave for America, and the mother knew that others would follow him, and this would be the last chance to have the whole family together, and she said it proved correct. All six of these were or became coal miners. The father was a coal miner, and the two daughters married coal miners. And uh, is that your wife? Oh, most of these are my wife here. How long were you married to your wife? 46 and a half years, or 46 years when she died. That was a picture of Bob Groves, who was the uh, superintendent of the Knox Coal Company at the time of the disaster. That, he was 12 years old, and that was to be his first first day in the mines in Scotland. Following the Knox mine disaster during multiple inquests into what may have caused it, Robert Groves would be highly scrutinized due to his position as superintendent at the Knox Coal Company. I attended every session of my father in law. In fact, I put up my, this house for bail for so he didn't have to go to jail at all. Since this action happened, sir, I have given a lot of thought and a lot of consideration. And I would say that there should be no mining done within 200 feet of a river. The ability coal left there solid, not a point of it touched. The day of the disaster, I was on the, on the afternoon shift and I reported for work at 12, totally unaware that this had occurred. I was assigned to patrol the railroad tracks to halt all traffic, rail or foot. Before anybody could stop me, and, Give me another assignment. I went down the slope and got as close to where it was as I could. Just, just absolutely violent and awesome. As I've said before, I have not led a sheltered life, but I was a little shaken up with what I saw. And uh, I was getting wet with the spray, and I was going to be out in the cold all day, so I left. So I, I picked out a, uh, a route of, of, of 100 yards below the below the break-in to a hundred yards or so above the break-in. And I was walking back and forth and observing. And I was on my way up when I ran into uh, Paul Pancotti, Emilio Pancotti, but we call him Paul for convenience. And he was in, in mining clothes. And I assumed that, that he was a second shift miner with no work. I told him I couldn't let him through. He said something rather angrily. Paul was born in the old country, and he spoke broken Italian and a broken English, take a choice. And I didn't catch what he said. And I said, Paul, I, I just can't let you through. But it, it's orders. And then he exploded and made it clear to me that he had just climbed out of the mine, uh, out of a shaft, and uh, that there were four or five, maybe six other people waiting at the foot of the shaft. So I went directly up to the up to the Eagle Air shaft opening. I called up out to people that were up on the bluff, up on the top of the cliff. I yelled for them to get rope, get rope, and we began pulling pulling men out. But I thought that I had homesteaders rights, squatters rights on that, that opening. I was the first one there and I thought I should be going inside. My father in law, who was the superintendent, had called over and said, Don't don't let Big Bill Hasty enter the mines. He's too heavy, which was just an excuse. I weighed 212 at that very moment. We were lowering Jim Jeffries, and he weighed 260 pounds. But anyway, my wife and I were expecting a baby that day. And Bob Gross didn't want his, his daughter widowed <laughs> with a new baby. Concerned about the fate of his father-in-law, Bill attended the investigative hearings and paid close attention to they were acquitted. I think the jury was was charmed by my my father-in-law's old old country presentation. In the spring of that year, Bill was employed by the number one contracting company, who undertook the task of constructing a copper dam to seal the breach at the bottom of the Susquehanna River. Through the years, Bill Hasty has devoted his life to telling the story of the Knox Mine disaster as well as anthracite, ethnic, and regional history. He has been the keystone to many local historical societies 
anthracite research and preservation groups. Bill also co-authored the book, Anthracite Labor Wars, with veteran author Robert P. Walensky. Veteran, minor, historian, author, father, and friend, William A. Hasty Sr. is an incredible asset to his community, always making himself available to pass on his knowledge and experiences to those who seek it. It might be worth noting that this, this was the main line of the Lehigh Valley Railroad uh, track. Uh, it ran through Wilkesbury. They had a freight line called the Mountain Cutoff that was that ran ran to the south of here and, and uh, ran through the mountains through Laura Run and bypassed with Wilkesbury. That was for strictly for freight trains. That was completed around 1888. And there are some great adventure stories there. That was great. That was great. It worked, worked pretty well, Bodie. Thanks a lot for doing that. And Good. thanks again to Dave Bracca. Uh, some of you have chatted questions about um, Dave Bracca's and, and his, and his uh, cousin uh, Al Bracca's Knox Mine Disaster documentary. Has it been released on CD yet? The answer is no. COVID has put a halt to that. They still want to tour with it uh, and, and, uh, make, and have screenings. So hang on to that one. And one other, one other point before we get some, maybe some questions or comments is that that, that, that unborn child that Bill Hasty talked about, the reason why his father-in-law wouldn't let him underground, that, that child is tuned in today on this broadcast. That's Megan Hasty. So we always know how old Megan is. Her birthday is coming up next week. Um, because, uh, because, you know, Megan's birthday is the Knox Mine Disasters anniversary year. So welcome, welcome, Megan. So um, how do you want to, you want to, you have any questions at your end, Bodie? Well, we were going to do a tribute now for, for Bill. So we, I have uh, Richard Healy. Um, I, I've opened up the mic to him. And then Bob, if you wanted to say a few words about Richard, uh, about, um, about Bill. And then if there's anyone else that's interested in saying a few words, uh, you know, raise your hand and we will, I will open the mic to you. So I think, uh, Richard, if you want to go ahead. Okay. Uh, can you hear me from 3,000 miles away? Like yes. you're next door. <laughs> uh, oh, excellent. Um, well, obviously, I'm not uh, the person who uh, uh, knew Bill for the longest. Um, but uh, even so, um, I think I first properly met Bill at the 125th anniversary of the Avondale mine disaster, uh, which of course is more than 25 years ago now, um, and have uh, kept in touch thereafter uh, uh, in person on my visits and uh, uh, latterly indeed uh, over uh, everybody's friend at Zoom. Um, I was always struck uh, by Bill's depth of knowledge of local history and his uh, uh, boundless enthusiasm for the preservation of anthracite heritage. And that was always greatly appreciated. But uh, he was also, uh, as we all know, someone with great strength of character uh, and very upright in his principles, uh, which I also appreciated. Um, but of course, he could always be relied upon uh, to give uh, voice to, uh, to that great Welsh hymn uh, uh, to tune Cum Ronda, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer, uh, or indeed the Welsh National Anthem uh, on any and every occasion when it was required, um, uh, whether it was at uh, uh, Avondale Memorial commemoration events that I remember, uh, uh, and in, uh, in his uh, last days in the uh, uh, VA hospital, which several of us uh, remember with uh, great affection. Uh, but it was only in his 99th year, or maybe his 100th year even, um, that I fully appreciated his, uh, his other great love, although I had heard stories of him uh, playing against Sicilians in the 1940s, 30s perhaps, um, and his great love, of course, was baseball. Um, and I really understood uh, uh, this 
when I had the pleasure of going with Megan and Bob and, and other folks um, and saw him rise from his wheelchair uh, at a, a rail riders uh, a game to give full voice uh, in the in the seventh innings sing along. Now, of course, that's something that uh, we don't have seven innings in critic in cricket. So uh, I, it was new to me that uh, uh, that that interesting innovation. But uh, Bill was certainly ready for it, uh, even at 99 years old. But uh, I've said enough. He embodied he embodied for me the very best of the of the anthracite, if I can use that term. Uh, I miss him greatly and count it a great privilege uh, to have known him. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak on this occasion. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very kindly. Let me just add a couple points and then others of you can, can join in. I, I, I wrote a tribute to Bill on his 100th birthday uh, for the Citizen's Voice, published in the Citizen's Voice. And in that, a few, a few clips still are very appropriate. How could we accurately count the number of historians, filmmakers, journalists, artists, school students, college students, graduate students, professors like me, and interested, interested citizens who have called upon his expertise? He had a fantastic memory. He had, I asked him the same question 10 times to be sure that I was getting the right answer. And he gave the same answer each of those 10 times. Uh, he, was, he was also very willing to connect with people, uh, but he was never one to brag or to show superiority. His humility was as apparent as his steadfastness. Indeed, he even held his composure when others did not always agree with his very progressive political views. And let me add that Bill did vote just before he passed away. Megan made sure of that. And that was, I'm sure, a great comfort to him. It was my tremendous privilege to have published mining history articles with him, to have spoken with him in public, to have co-authored Anthracite Labor Wars. I often thought that I was simply Bill Hastie's scribe. Uh, he knew he had the knowledge. I mean, I had the book knowledge, but he, had, he, was, he was there. He was on, on, on the ground. And so we co-authored co this and it was a, a joint work. It was my, my writings mainly, but his, his stories and his ideas. Um, in these efforts, I was like so many other local history enthusiasts to have benefited from his extensive knowledge and kind mentorship. Um, in some, Bill Hasty has been a real treasure to our region. He has built dozens upon dozens of friendships he built and acquaintanceships over decades of doing what he did best. And we are all the richer for it. So I congratulated him on his 100th birthday in this piece. I said, enjoy your century, Mark, and thanks for everything. And today we lament his loss along with the family, but we also celebrate all that he gave for all those many, many decades so thanks, Bill. So thanks, uh, thanks, Bob. Linda Scott had, uh, had her hand up. Can you hear me? It's, you're quiet, but yes, we can hear you. Yeah, many memories of Bill singing at the Washburn Street Cemetery, which was mentioned. Can you speak up, Linda, please speak up. It was already mentioned that about Bill singing at the Washburn Street Cemetery, he would always oblige and he would sing the Welsh National Anthem and nobody could sing it just like Bill and that's what I'm gonna uh, miss. And uh, I know many of you know that Bill and I were honored for our work uh, with the Avondale mine disaster. We were honored by the St. David Society a, a few years ago when we, we got awards. And uh, I have a picture during that event and with Bill and I receiving the awards and, and that's going to be a treasured picture that I have. But so many great memories, so many stories and I've learned so much from him and I'm just going to miss him like everybody else. Thanks, Linda. 
Yeah, Bill was important to us uh, at the museum as well. I mean, certainly his expertise and knowledge and presence. Um, you know, I haven't been along around as long as many of you, but it was great to know him for the last um, the last eight years and have his uh, have his just his being at, at the museum at a number of events and certainly seeing him at the Knox program um, has been great. We will all miss him. Um, I just received a, uh, a chat from Megan Hasty, and um, Megan on her Facebook page uh, just had a, a tribute to one of the Knox disaster victims, Willie Sinclair, who was a relative of Bill Hasty's. So Bill lost a relative uh, in this disaster, and so did Megan, of course. Um, Megan wanted me to read her. Facebook blog, but I, I, can't access, I can't access it really easily here now. But the Hasty family always looked upon January 22nd as more than just a tragedy for the reason. I mean, it was a personal family loss when Willie Sinclair was one of the 12 victims. So I want to add that. Well, thanks. Um... This has been a really great program. I think we have some a, a few minutes. If there's any other questions or comments that anybody has, um, you can go in the Q and A or the chat. We'd be happy to um, happy to to look at them. <clears throat> well, Chris, uh, Chris, Maddie writes to to all of us. Uh, we will always remember our conversations with Bill, especially sitting with him at uh, at Savos the night after the release of the documentary at Pittston Area High School many years ago. It was a pleasure to be in his company and we will always, and we always learn something. Chris and Deirdre, um, Maddie's. Very true, Bill, Bill all, always a seminar when you were in Bill Hasty's company. So Bob, there was a, a, a request from Bert Proshka, if you can recite the names of the men whose lives were lost in the disaster. Um, I don't have that right in front of me, and I and, and I wouldn't want to uh, I wouldn't want to miss anyone. I mean, I could I could from memory probably rattle off a bunch of them, uh, but I I wouldn't want to miss anybody. Perhaps perhaps between us all we can do it, huh? Um, of course, there was I mentioned Willie Sinclair. Uh, in his crew was Danny Stephanitis from Swervel, the youngest man to die. There were the three Rockmen who were the first to die. Uh, Gazinski. Um, um, <laughs> I'm gonna forget, I'm gonna forget the other two. They'll come back. I'm not the greatest with names. There was uh, Frank Burns, who was in the bottom of the mine and didn't stand a chance. Um, uh, the, uh, the, he, he was with another gentleman whose name I'm gonna forget. Um, how about some help from some people? Can we, can we pull out some of the others? Um, I'm looking. <laughs> sorry about that, but I, but names are not one of my specialties. Any luck? Not yet. I got him right now. Ready? And I, uh, Sam Altieri, John Beloga. How could I forget John Beloga? Benjamin Boyer was down the bottom of the mine with Frank Burns, who I've mentioned. The Rockmen were Charles Featherman, Joseph Kaczynski, Dominic Kavalinski, and Rockmen were, would drill uh, through solid rock to access, uh, to access a new vein from a vein above. So they were going from one vein to another, from the Pittston vein to the Marcy vein. Uh, Frank Orlowski, um, Eugene Ostrowski, I mentioned Sinclair, I mentioned Stephanitis, and Herman Zalonis was the 12th. So Altieri, Beloga, Boyer, Burns, Featherman, Gazinski, Kavaleski, Orlowski, Ostrowski, Sinclair, Stephanitis, and Zalonis. The most common type of name was Slavic. Um, 
but there were, you know, other, you know, Sinclair was a, was a, uh, was a, a, a Scots, a Scottish name. Uh, Featherman's probably German. Um, Zolotis is, um, that's Lithuanian and Lithuanians are not Slavs. And I think, I think Al Alteri is Italian, Burns is Irish. And I think Boyer might have been shortened from something like Boyarski. I'm not, uh, I'm not certain about that right now. Okay, and we had a comment or something from Helen Grubsky. Um, let see, Helen, if you, I had to promote you to a panelist because it says your version of Zoom is outdated, but go ahead. She's on mute, Bodhi. Uh, Bodhi. Yeah, Helen, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Do it again. Do it again. Yeah, just uh, the uh, what was the new town where the Centralia residents were relocated? To what was the new town's name? Oh, Does Jay know that? Yeah, I, it's in the song, and I just can't uh, think. think. Is it a town that still exists? I'm not sure if it still exists. Let me through, get through my notes here and I'll get back to you in a second if that's okay. Not a problem. Glenmar Gardens. Glenmar Gardens. And is it, how close is it to Centralia? I couldn't really tell you. I don't really know where it's located. I'm, I'm uh, about maybe 45 minutes to 50 minutes south of there where I live at. And I'm just uh, really sort of just familiar with Centralia. So uh, other than what was in the book there geographically, I don't uh, really know where it was in location uh, you know, related to Centralia. I'm sorry about that. No, not a problem. I'll I'll do some uh, some research on it. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Well, I think that that probably gets us close to wrapping up for the program at 90 minutes. Bob, do you have some final comments? No, I, I don't have any um, final comments uh, this time around. I think we've covered a lot of territory. Um, this year. I want to thank everybody for coming. We had up to uh, pushing, I don't know, 50 people, 45, 50 people at one time, and that's just fantastic. Uh, thanks to Jay again, and thanks to you for your wonderful presentation, Bodhi. PCN has a website where you can look at their schedule of events if you want to know when they're going to rebroadcast this and the other events in Anthracite Mining Heritage Month. We hope to see some of you at the two remaining uh, Anthracite Mining Heritage Month uh, events. Um, we hope to see you um, uh, at, at uh, uh, the R Richards event and the Mike Corb's event, Mike Corb Monday, Richard next Wednesday. And then next Saturday, we'd love to have you come and just at least even look in if you're thinking about joining us on this trip to the UK. It's gonna be a fantastic trip. We are concerned. Of course, COVID is going to be the, the question. We, we hope we can go over in, in late June into early July, 11 days, but, but the virus may determine that for us. Uh, I'm sure we'll need vaccine proof that when we enter the country, uh, we're going to fly into Edinburgh, Scotland, where it begins, and then into England, and then ending up in Cardiff, Wales. So uh, with that, I will bid everyone farewell. And, and Bodhi, do you have a final comment or an announcement about the associates or something? Well, I don't, but uh, uh, you know, thanks again for organizing this, Bob. We're always happy to participate. And like we said earlier, the Anthracite Heritage Museum and Eckley Myers Village will be uh, hopefully reopening in April sometime. Um, it's been a long, uh, long year for all of us. So I hope to see you, uh, hope to see when we can reopen. And look, check out our website and Facebook pages for, uh, for programs and events and upcoming exhibits. Um, we will be hosting Scott Herring's 50th anniversary um, coming up in two years, I believe. Um, so, so join us. And then uh, if you feel compelled to make a contribution to help the, uh, the associate group, our nonprofit, uh, there are links on the website and the Facebook page. So thanks again, everyone.
and have a great afternoon. I hope to see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Jay. All right. Thank you.